Open only mode. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thanks to everyone who has joined us, especially those of you who are joining from overseas at such a late hour um, or early hour as the case might be. My name is Laya Greeno and I'm coordinator for NGO effectiveness at Interaction where I manage our evaluation and program effectiveness working group. For those of you not familiar with Interaction, we're the largest coalition of U.S.-based international NGOs with nearly 200 member organizations. So we're very happy to welcome you today to the first webinar in a series of webinars on impact evaluation that Interaction is developing with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation. These webinars are meant to accompany a four-part impact evaluation guidance note series, the first of which is an introduction to impact evaluation authored by Patricia Rogers. I think given the large number of people who registered for this webinar that Patricia's reputation precedes her, but for those of you who don't know Patricia, she's Professor of Public Sector Evaluation at RMIT University and is joining us very early this morning from Australia. Um, Patricia has worked on public sector evaluation and research for more than 25 years with both government and non-governmental organizations and across a wide range of program areas. Um, she's also someone who's very committed to improving evaluation practice, which is why we're so pleased to have her involvement in this guidance note and webinar series. So I'll begin our session today um, with an overview of the, the series. Um, and then I will be turning it over to Patricia for her presentation on the guidance note. Uh, we'll then have about 20 minutes for questions and answers, and then I'll conclude with some next steps. So the purpose of the, the series, the guidance note series I mentioned, is to increase organizations' understanding of and ability to conduct high quality impact evaluation. So there's, as I mentioned, there's four notes in the series. The first is an introduction to impact evaluation, which is what you'll see presented today. Um, the next is linking monitoring and evaluation to impact evaluation by Bert Perrin, who's um, an independent consultant with many years of evaluation experience. Um, our third note in the series is an introduction to mixed methods for impact evaluation by Michael Bamberger, who is also an independent consultant. Um, and finally, use of impact evaluation results by David Bombright, who's the chief executive of Keystone Accountability. Um, this series is particularly targeted at NGO staff um, and is therefore being developed with extensive input from interaction members, um, but we believe that it will be applicable to others as well, and so I'm really glad that others from U.S. government agencies um, and, and domestic agencies are joining as well. Um, the notes are, are really meant to be an introduction to these various topics, so raising issues that senior managers, evaluation specialists, and others involved in impact eval evaluation should be thinking about, um, providing some practical guidance and pointing people to additional resources. So they won't answer all, all the questions you might have about these topics, but at least they'll point you in the right direction and, and highlight things you should be considering. Um, so our hope is that they'll help make people make more informed decisions around impact evaluation. Um, the notes will be about 20 to 30 pages in length and they'll be translated into Spanish, French, and Arabic. So once the, once the notes are ready, as the notes are being developed, um, they'll go on Interactions website at the URL you see on your screen. Um, so the, the recording from today will be posted shortly afterwards. Um, and the, the English version of the note will also be available on, on this page as well, and the translations will be forthcoming. So just a few things before I turn it over to Patricia, just for those not familiar with GoToWebinar. Um, if you want to minimize or maximize the, the screen you're seeing, um, you can click on the on the orange arrow. Um, you can view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking on this little blue box. And 
then if you have any questions, you can type them in, in that question box there. Um, due to the large number of participants, we won't be using the raise the hand feature, um, and you'll remain on mute for the rest of the webinar. But if you have a question, please type it in. I'll be monitoring the questions throughout Patricia's presentation. Um, so feel free to type them in there as you think of them. Um, and I think with that, Patricia, I'll turn it over to you. So. Hello everybody, good afternoon, good evening and good morning uh, to those. Who I'm delighted with the response to this, um, to this webinar um, and looking forward to having a chance to discuss these issues with you. We know how important impact evaluation is. Uh, we know that there's been a, a lot of concern about um, methods uh, and practicality of doing impact evaluation. So I'm just checking off, you've got the screen now, you should have um, the, the screen of the, the, the world. Uh, who's uh, joining us today. By impact evaluation, we're talking about evaluations that investigate the changes brought about by an intervention. So they're a particular type of evaluation. And it's really important for us to start by remembering how important the other types of evaluation are. And uh, guidance Note 2 by Bert Perrin talks about how impact evaluation should be part of a whole monitoring and evaluation system, how monitoring data can help build the, uh, provide a basis for impact evaluation and how an impact evaluation can guide the development of monitoring systems and how impact evaluations are an integral part of cost benefit and cost effectiveness evaluations. But today we're talking about impact evaluations and by impacts we're in the guidance notes using the OECD DAC um, definition that they are not just the intended results but the positive and negative, intended and unintended, direct and indirect, primary and secondary effects produced by an intervention. In practice it's often helpful for an evaluation to include both outcomes and impacts to understand how these fit together. This overview today is based on two big ideas. In recent years there's been a lot of focus on the issue of attribution. Did the intervention actually cause the impacts that have been observed? In many ways this has been a useful focus because there have been too many impact evaluations which didn't adequately address attribution. But with the focus on attribution, there has come a risk of ignoring other important aspects of impact evaluation. It's not enough to know just whether or not the intervention produced the impact. We also need to know about the intervention. If the intervention has not been successful, we need to be able to understand if it was due to problems in the implementation. And if the intervention has been successful, and we want to replicate it, we need to know what it is that we're replicating. For judging whether or not the intervention has been a success, we have to do more than just measure the intended impacts. We have to understand and take account of important unintended impacts, positive and negative. We need to take account of the distribution of benefits, not just looking at the average impact, but understanding, for example, whether the development intervention has helped the very poor or has it in fact increased the gap between the, the poor and the very poor? And we need ways of synthesising these different aspects into an overall evaluative judgement about the intervention. And then to be able to translate the knowledge from impact evaluations, we need to understand how the intervention has produced the impacts and therefore how the intervention might need to be adapted to work in different contexts. So methods that address attribution don't help with these other tasks and good impact evaluation needs them. So the first big idea is that when we're talking about methods for impact evaluation, we're talking about methods for all of these tasks and that's what we'll be looking at today. The second big idea is about how we go about choosing those methods. Whatever approach we take to impact evaluation, they need to be useful, credible, feasible, ethical. 
and that means they need to suit the situation. I, I hope you're not getting a lot of noise in the background. Unfortunately, it's early morning here in Australia and there's a, some significant cleaning going on right near me, so I hope this is not affecting the sound. When we're choosing methods for impact evaluation, we need to think about the purpose of the evaluation. Uh, who's going to use it? How are they going to use it? Is our evaluation intended to support replication? So we're trying to find an effective intervention that can be scaled up. Or are we trying to support ongoing adaptation um, to new situations? Is the evaluation intended to provide downwards accountability to the communities with whom the organisation is working? Or is it to provide upwards accountability to funders, including taxpayers and donors, and reassure them that their money is being well spent? These will lead to different approaches to impact evaluation. The time frames are critically important. Uh, when, when do we need the results? When are the decisions going to be made that the evaluation is depending on? And when will it be reasonable to see evidence of the impacts or of intermediate outcomes that precede them? For many interventions, we know that the impacts will not be visible for a long time. Many environmental projects, many projects that are looking at generational poverty. So how do we, how do we frame our impact evaluation to be able to get the information uh, early enough to for inform decisions, but late enough to be able to see evidence of the impacts? Our impact evaluations also need to pay attention to the resources what information is already available, how much time is available for people to spend on this, what expertise is already here, what, it, what money is there to bring in additional expertise. What methods will be seen by the primary intended users and what's going to be culturally and ethical, ethically appropriate for the evaluation stakeholders including the beneficiary communities. This is a, a, a long list of uh, issues to consider and it makes the, the, the process of choosing impact evaluation methods uh, not just a formulaic one, but one that needs to be really carefully considered. So today in the webinar, I want to talk about the process of choosing methods for six different aspects of impact evaluation, um, sketching out what, what they need to do and what some of those options are. There's more information about these in the guidance note, including links to, to more detailed information. We want to cover a few uh, frequently asked questions about impact evaluation, which came up in the, in the writing of the guidance note, and then talk about some um, uh, common challenges that, that, that also came up during the writing. And please, um, please do put questions uh, throughout in the, the box, because uh, we're very keen to hear from you. So the first task in impact evaluation is to clarify the values, the values that underpin evaluation because evaluation is about valuing what is good, what is bad, what is better, what is worse, whose values are going to drive the evaluation and values about what because we have obviously values about what are desirable impacts, we can also have values about what are undesirable impacts. And we often have values about what's a desirable distribution of benefits. For example, should we judge success in terms of the average educational outcome or improvements for the, the most disadvantaged or bringing a vulnerable or disadvantaged group up to the same level as their more advantaged counterpoints. All programs have stated goals, but they're not enough to clarify the values. So some methods that we can use here are of two types. One is to help articulate the tacit values that the different stakeholders have. Uh, appreciative inquiry is one where key stakeholders recall the times when the program worked particularly well and then identify the values that it exemplified during those times. Uh, community surveys can give uh, individuals in the community a chance to nominate or rate the issues that they see as most important to address or what success would look like in terms of the standard of, of performance. And most significant change is a structured process for generating and selecting stories of change 
that identify what different individuals and groups see as the most important outcomes or impacts. And there are other methods. And then we need some methods to negotiate between these different values. And two, two that I've, we've included here, the Delphi model where you negotiate with a group at a distance so that you minimise the interpersonal politics and allow them to, to form a consensus decision about what the values will be. Or a face-to-face -face one of sticky dot voting, which is very hands-on and allows people to highlight what they see as the most important issues. The second set of tasks is that we need methods for developing a theory or a model of how we think things work, which will be in two parts. One is uh, a description of what the change process involves. How does change come about? And then how the intervention will bring this about. Those two parts are really important. Um, and many of the ways that, um, that people do this really doesn't get to the heart of it, uh, of, of what it is that the, the intervention is doing. Uh, so this is a lot more than just drawing boxes of inputs and outputs and outcomes, but sort of saying, what are the arrows? How does this come about? Um, and depending on when this theory of change is developed, it could draw on a combination of sources, official documents and stated objectives, research into similar interventions, of observations of the intervention and, and discussing different with different stakeholders how they think it, work, it works and helping them to articulate their mental models. And it may well be that there are multiple theories of change different theories that show how the intervention works at different stages, how it works in different contexts, how it works to achieve different uh, impacts, and different theories that develop over time as understanding changes, and different theories that different people have. So this, this stage is not a simple matter of doing a, doing a log frame, doing a, a logic model and saying, well, it's done. It's, it's really thinking about this and coming back to this throughout the impact of evaluation. Uh, some of the different ways of doing this is uh, through the, the logical framework approach, uh, which sets out this theory of change in a particular way. Some of the other ways, uh, and the outcomes hierarchy, uh, sometimes called theory of change, doesn't show the program as a inputs and outputs but as a series of outcomes. So it, it actually recognises the different stages that a project goes through that can have activities at different levels. And I also want to mention outcome mapping, which is a particular form of, of uh, theory of change or program theory that's very useful when one program does part of the causal chain and then hands it over to another organisation. And, and this involves identifying who those boundary partners are um, and, and what you're wanting them to do and how you might seek to influence them. And it really focuses on that handover between organisations. And when you look at a lot of our interventions, many of them are, are of that form and outcome mapping helps you identify really important issues. Once you have your program theory, you can use it in your impact evaluation to identify some intermediate outcomes that can be observed within the time frame of the evaluation. You can identify whether uh, an unsuccessful intervention is due to theory failure or implementation failure. Um, and you can help to identify these differential effects. The third set of methods uh, for impact evaluation are, are all around the measurement and description, how, how things are. And clearly we want to have very good measurement and description of impact, but also other important variables. So we need to, once we have our theory of change, our logic model, that will really help us to decide what we need to measure and then we need to work out how. Taking into account this balancing act between being as accurate as we can while also being feasible, timely, ethical and relevant. So we need to understand the different, the different elements there, including the context, including understanding uh, what contribution are the programs, the participant characteristics and the implementation environment have made. And here's, here's the area where there's a lot of different methods for collecting, analysing, retrieving data. 
um, that, can, that can be used for impact evaluation. And some of the really exciting um, examples here coming out of Africa are talking about using mobile phone uh, logging of all sorts of data, which both gives much more more timely and cost-effective um, data, but also engages can engage uh, the community in, in the evaluation. The fourth set is around causal analysis, and this is this is the, the part that where a lot of people uh, uh, attention has gone. Did the intervention cause the impacts, or if we recognise that impacts are caused by multiple factors, did it contribute to the impacts? One of the important features of an impact evaluation is that it doesn't just gather evidence that the impacts have occurred, but it does try to understand the intervention's role in producing them. The, the terms vary a lot. Uh, some people, by causal attribution, are really trying to pin down which bits of it were can be solely attributed to the intervention. Other times, people really say, "Well, it's attribution, but we know that there've been other other factors um, producing that," or um, formal collaboration. We often have a group collaborating to produce a joint impact, such as when international NGOs partner together or partner with local governments or partner with communities. So for example, in agricultural research, um, the impacts in terms of improved productivity are often due to a long chain of basic research followed by applied research, followed by product development, followed by communication and extension and, and technical assistance. And an investment in any one of these might reasonably claim that it was essential in producing the impacts in, in livelihood improvements. But it would not have been able to do so without the other interventions. So in other words, it might have been a necessary intervention, but it's not sufficient to bring about that impact by itself. It's helpful to think about a causal analysis in terms of three components. So the starting point is the factual, to compare the actual results to those expected if the theory of change were true. When, where and for whom did the impacts occur? Are these results consistent with a the theory that the intervention caused or contributed to the results? And some of these methods here, the comparative case studies, dose response, beneficiary or expert attribution, predictions and temporality, looking at the timing of the impacts, can see whether they are consistent with those, the, the theory that it was the intervention that produced the results. Temporality is really important. Um, if you see a result too soon, it's, it's, it might not be plausible that the, the intervention has produced it. The second component is the, counter, the counterfactual. Um, what would have happened in the absence of the intervention? And, and this is a focus of a lot of, in, of, of impact evaluation, and there are a lot of different ways of producing a, a counterfactual, uh, sometimes by use of a control group, which is uh, randomly, uh, where it's created by random allocation, and sometimes by a variety of comparison groups, where the comparison group is created in another way. But there are other ways of creating a counterfactual, including a logically constructed counterfactual in, in situations where it's not possible to use these other methods. And then the third uh, cluster of methods is around identifying and ruling out alternative explanations. And here it's more about a set of strategies, about working with people to identify what are some other plausible explanations for, for the result and can they be ruled out if you, if you gather some additional evidence. And so a really strong causal analysis picks up all of these and even though I've put randomised control groups in the counterfactual, when you look at good randomised control trials, they actually address each of these. They think very hard about the factual, about when they will, when it's, it's likely that they will um, see um, impacts, they, they look for issues around dose response where um, they see whether those who have received more or received a full 
uh, dose of the intervention have better results. And good ones actually do also look at checking out alternative explanations. And then there are some approaches that combine these different types of methods. And we have uh, links to uh, more information about these. Uh, contribution analysis, multiple lines and levels of evidence, and then one which combines both of these into, into a one package, collaborative outcomes reporting. These um, systematically work through this process of sending out a, a theory of change, identifying what to measure, and then working through these different elements of the causal analysis. So the fifth set of methods is around synthesis. And this one is very often neglected in impact evaluation. So let's think about some uh, different scenarios that we might have about whether we, for example, have positive impacts for everyone, pos positive impacts just for some, negative impacts for some, negative impacts for all. And then what you would say is your overall synthesis. In this scenario, it's really obvious to see um, what, what you would say. Here, where everyone gets positive impacts, no one gets negative impacts. It's very easy to say we would call that good. On the other side, if we had a program which had, where no one had positive impacts and everyone had negative impacts, we'd be very confident to say this is a bad program or ineffective. But what do we do about the, the messy ones in between? What if we had this scenario where we've had positive impacts for some, but not for everyone, not for everyone who's being targeted? Would we call that still a good program? Um, how good do these positive impacts have to be? How many do the sum have to be? Or, or how important might it be to, for, the, for them to get positive impacts if, if they are, for example, the very poor? At what point would we say this is a good program even though it's only had positive impacts for some? Or what if we've had positive impacts for some and negative impacts for some? At what point would we call that overall a good program or an effective program. So these issues about synthesis are very often ignored and there are some strategies for doing this. Um, we can look at synthesis across an individual evaluation and also across multiple evaluations. So some possible methods that we, we talk about briefly in the guidance note is about using a weighted scale where we identify criteria and set weights in advance or using an evaluation rubric and a global assessment scale where we work with the key stakeholders to, to identify a description of what success looks like on a three or a five point scale using descriptors and, and linking that to the evidence that we have. There's, a, there's a, some very interesting work going on in this area and I think it's an area of impact evaluation that has often been neglected. We often just assume if on average we've got an increase in the intended impacts, it must be an effective program. And these, these methods take us more into the evaluative territory. And finally across these methods, the sixth set of methods is around reporting and supporting use. Um, how are we going to report and to whom? How do we make best use of verbal, written, visual reports? How do we um, support people to then actually make sense of these, this information and to use it? Um, and, and how do we do that, particularly in a context where we are seeking to engage um, communities and intended beneficiaries in the process? How do we make sure that the reports can meet their needs and yet also meet other needs. For some stakeholders, it's extremely important to have a very thick evaluation report with a very long methodology so they can show they've really got value for their money. Um, in, in most cases, that's not actually a useful evaluation report. So you might need multiple formats for multiple users. And looking at creative ways of, of reporting can make a huge difference to the use of impact evaluation. So that's a sketch of six types of methods. Um, what I want to do uh, now before we open up to questions is just talk briefly about some uh, two key uh, frequently asked questions and then a couple of common dilemmas. The first one is when should impact evaluation be done? 
and I, there are two parts to this. Um, one is about the circumstances um, and fundamentally we should be focusing impact evaluations where there's this clear need and intent to use the findings. It would be a real problem if the interest in impact evaluation meant that all interventions were required to have an impact evaluation. Um, there's a risk that um, either there would be huge uh, resources required for this that would then be taken away from um, program implementation or the resources would be spread so thinly that the evaluations would not be good enough, that they'd be superficial. So a more effective strategy is to focus impact evaluation resources on interventions where they're likely to be useful. So those circumstances might be uh, where it actually isn't known uh, how effective they are. There's not a good understanding of them and better evidence is, is needed to inform decisions about whether to continue to fund them or whether to scale up them up or to whether to redirect funding to something else. Uh, they're very important for high risk interventions where the concern is not so much about the positive impacts but checking that negative impacts are being uh, avoided or, or managed. Uh, it's often important to do impact evaluations of uh, innovative programs uh, where it's not just a matter of saying does it work but how does it work and how can we learn from that for informing policy and practice in other areas. And impact evaluation can be very helpful where we have partnerships, where uh, organisations are working together but they don't actually understand well what it is that each of them brings to the program and so an impact evaluation when done well can actually strengthen the partnership. Uh, the timing is important. If we do it too early we won't have evidence of impacts. If we do it too late all the decisions about uh, replication, scaling up or even continuing will already have had to be made. So there's a challenge in timing for impact evaluation. There's another big question about when impact evaluation should be done and one version uh, says that um, we should only do it when we have a stable intervention so that we can, um, so we know we've got some evidence that it's effective and now this is, this is giving very high quality evidence that's effective before scaling it up. The other way of looking at it is to say well many interventions will never be stable because for them to be effective they have to go on adapting and evolving to new circumstances and so in the, that argument would say impact evaluation is also useful for emergent and adaptive and responsive programs and the approach of developmental evaluation is specifically looking at that. How do, we, how do we build knowledge about what is working in a way that helps us to continue to make it work? The second big question is around who should do impact evaluation and there are options about having an external evaluator or an evaluation team. Uh, an internal team that's internal to the organisation but separate to the implementers. Impact evaluations can be done by the implementing unit, by the community, by intended beneficiaries or by some combination of these. An external evaluator can bring a range of expertise and experience that might not be available within the organisation and they may have more independence and credibility than an internal evaluator. For for example, the USAID evaluation policy sets out an expectation that most evaluations will be done by an external evaluator. But for some stakeholders, external evaluators are not perceived as always unbiased, as their data gathering and interpretations may be affected by their lack of familiarity with the context. In some cases, it would be better to involve program stakeholders and all community members in conducting an evaluation to improve the quality of data by supporting better access to data, particularly key informants and more appropriate interpretation of the data. Uh, so this is, this is one of the areas where a really careful decision needs to be made, again about who are the intended users and what is going to be credible. And there needs to be then a balance between 
uh, different ways of achieving independence, about uh, providing transparency of the methods and the data, uh, considering whether cultural knowledge and access will be important to get good quality data and what will be seen as credible. Uh, participatory approaches to managing evaluation typically involve programs staff, community members and development partners. They participate not only in collecting the data but in negotiating the purpose of the impact evaluation. Developing the key evaluation questions, designing an evaluation to answer them and following through on the results. Right. That's a challenge. We've missed a, missed a slide. I'm going to have to talk briefly to the um, common challenges. Um, as, as I was developing the guidance note, there were a couple of key challenges which came out, um, which are discussed in the um, guidance note. Um, how do we do impact evaluation when there's a lot of variation in how it's implemented and, and the environment across different sites? How do we do impact evaluation to take account of the fact that's, that there is a lot of variation in the impacts achieved for different people, uh, where it works very well for some people and not for others? How do we um, do an impact evaluation of an intervention which has lots of different com components that make it up and those components are not the same at every site? How do we do impact evaluation when there's a, a very long time scale for the intervention but only a short one for the evaluation? How do we understand the influence of other programs and factors? And how do we uh, do impact evaluation when we have resource constraints? So these, these are some questions which are um, set out in the, um, the guidance note and some, some initial responses to those and I'd be happy to uh, talk about those further if, if you have some questions about those. But I just want to finish with the um, main uh, messages for this. I hope um, this sort of overview has given a different way of thinking about impact evaluation. That I found it very helpful to sort of slice off the, the different tasks involved in impact evaluation. Um, I find it really helps people when they're having discussions about impact evaluation to be very clear now we're having a discussion about attribution and now we're having a discussion about me measurement and let's remember to have a discussion about synthesis. It really helps to uh, clarify those discussions about methods and, and I hope that it's introduced you to a few new methods that you're interested to follow up and have some idea about where they might be useful. And uh, finally, the, the, the message about really thinking through the situation in terms of choosing which, is, which are going to be the right combinations of methods for you. The guidance notes has links to um, additional resources on particular methods, so there's a lot to uh, follow up on that. But I'm going to finish there and look forward to any questions. Patricia, thanks for, for going yeah. through that. Um, I think you've you've laid out um, a lot for us to think about from starting off and developing a theory of change that will underlie the, the impact evaluation to synthesizing results and thinking through issues about who should be involved in an impact evaluation. So we already have um, several questions um, and let me just switch over so you can see some of that. Um, hopefully everyone can see some of the, the questions. Um, so I think the first questions we can take together, um, the first from um, Pablo Rodriguez Villella asks, can you consider the theory of change as a method to articulate tacit values? And then sort of related to that, a question from Veronica Olasabal asking whether um, clarification of values should happen not only when planning an evaluation, but as the intervention itself is being planned. Good. Thank you. And um, thank you for those questions. Um, I, I think for to, to to start with Veronica's one, I mean, absolutely, the, the values should be clarified when the intervention is being planned. Um, 
and sometimes that's reflected in the documentation but sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes there's, there's a lot of implicit tacit values that only become evident when um, when they've sort of violated, when so there might have been, for example, um, a, a value about um, the targeting of the program or um, the level of improvement that would be considered in, enough to make the program worthwhile that hasn't been documented. So I think I, I found that it's it's definitely worth um, uh, having a. a, a specific activity to, to revisit that, um, to fill in the gaps in the documentation, but also to check that things haven't changed or that the people haven't changed. Because sometimes the people who set up a program and the people who are then managing it and the people who are going to use the evaluation actually have three quite different sets of values about it. And it's not always evident in the program documentation. So, so it's, it's both and. You should uh, clarify the values when we're planning the intervention and we should clarify them when we're planning the evaluation. And so to pick up Pablo's question, um, definitely theory of change it, it is, is, is a way of artic, artic, um, making clear that the values that underpin it because you have to say, well, what, what, would it, what would it look like? But again, some theories of change, just to, they'll, they'll have a box with a label in it about the um, uh, the improvements in terms of impacts, but there's not information about what that looks like. And I certainly don't recommend putting in the logic model, you know, 60% of students will have at least a two grade increase in their reading scores in your logic model because it really clutters it up and it means that people don't give that the, the due care that it needs. Um, I really like Sue Fennell's approach, uh, her program theory matrix where you then take your logic model and then you ask a whole series of questions about, about each of the, the outcomes in the, in the chain, uh, including what would success look like and you can, because it's, it's on a separate document, you can go into it as much detail as you like. So I think if you do theory of change well, then you certainly do articulate the tacit values. Uh, yeah, Lai, would you? Um, so our, the next question um, is from Rick Davies, and he asks or says that impact evaluation has in the past been concerned with long-term changes. Has this focus changed? And then also, how do you deal with multiple or different theories of change? If you focus on boundary partners as an outcome mapping, does this mean you end up ignoring more social distant impacts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the, um, and thanks Rick for your question, um, and as, as, as you know, these are um, some of the continuing discussions in impact evaluation, that, that the long-term nature of it has been um, a, um, a part of the definition of, of what are impacts compared to outcomes. But in fact, when you look at many of the examples of impact evaluations, they are looking at shorter term ones. So the conditional cash transfer impact evaluations, for example, initially we're looking at whether kids went to school, which is not a long-term impact. It's actually a, you know, an intermediate outcome because kids going to school is a way of getting to, hopefully, kids being educated, learning how to read. Um, and, but because of the time frames, they were not looking at those longer, longer term impacts, uh, even though they are described as impact evaluations. So I think this, is, this comes back to this point about how we balance um, wanting to have some information early to inform policy while recognising that many uh, impacts are long term. And that, again, the, the theory of change is helpful because it can identify some indicators that, okay, you're not guaranteed you're going to get the impacts, but at least you're, you, you're going down the right path. Uh, the issue of multiple different theories of change is, is one I think we need to pay more attention to. Um, it, it's, it's quite easy to have different theories of change that, that all are congruent, that all match. Um, so you could have, and I think it would be very useful and has been very useful to have an overall theory of change and then to sort of zoom down and, and look in more detail at some aspects of it or have variations of the theory of change for different situations or different groups. But they, can, they, they all still in the end assemble into, into one. 
Um, what's more, a different issue is when you have competing theories of change about how something works. Does it work through incentives or does it work through, um, through positive incentives or through negative incentives? What is it that's going on? And um, I think the, the, the best way to do that is to articulate it and then go, go after evidence about it. And um, the, one of the things I really like about um, Ray Pawson and Nick Tilley's book, uh, Realistic Evaluation, is that they lay out eight or nine different theories of change for a single intervention and then say, well, if it was like this, if it was happening in this way, this is what you would expect to see. So then they, they identify what the factual would be. And, and I think we can learn a lot from that. I think a lot of impact evaluations just lay out a single theory of change that, that, that doesn't really think hard about how change might come about. So I, th I think in some cases we do need to lay them out where they're, um, they, they're competing and see what the evidence then says about them. Uh, and that, that, yeah, no, there's just one more. Can I speak to that one? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and this, this issue about the boundary partners and outcome mapping, um, uh, outcome mapping like a lot of um, approaches is, is changing and adapting as, as new people pick it up. And in the uh, early days, the focus was on outcomes, not on impacts. It was on looking at that, that middle level set of results. I think there are some people now using the basic ideas of it and this focus on boundary partners, but then also looking very seriously at what's at the, what's at the end of the causal chain and looking at the, the impacts. Not to start to say, well, I did 20% and you did 40%, but to say together this is what we achieved. And, and I think that's a, a useful development for many people. Patricia, just going back um, to to the conversation about multiple theories of change. We've gotten a, a request for you to talk a little bit more about varied implementation across multiple sites and how you would deal with that in an impact evaluation. Patricia? But I can't. There you go. We're, you're back. OK. Did you catch the, the last question? Uh, I can just saw Rick Davies. Okay, sorry. Yeah. This one isn't one that's up on the screen, but it's one that's uh. that's related to the to the issue of multiple or theories of change. Um, so the question is just a request for you to talk a little bit more about what you can do if there is varied implementation across multiple sites. How do you address that in, in an impact evaluation? Okay. Um, well, um, this is this is something that I um, I wrestled with it to a great degree. I had um, particular evaluation. This was a major issue. I had 635 different projects at different sites, um, doing incredibly different things, and we were required to make some overall statement about this program and, and what was working and what worked and you know what were the common things that we could say. And, and so the big issue for us was to say, are they in fact using the same theory of change? Are they fundamentally go, using the same way of thinking about how change comes about but then having different actions? So uh, there, there were superficially, there were a lot of differences and you might say they're so different we can't say anything about them. But when you looked behind the, the details of the activities, there was a common logic to them. And that was not accidental. They had been planned um, using a, a, a very um, detailed um, process of a theory of change at the planning stage that actually did um, uh, inform the way they, they planned their projects. So that, that was an, an issue for us. So you know, they, one of their big, big challenges for these, they were programs around that were strengthening families and strengthening communities. And a big issue for all of them was actually engaging people in the program. Um, so they used a, a variety of strategies, but actually all of them were around um, treating engagement uh, very seriously and having some common strategies behind what they were doing. 
Um, so that was the first thing, to look for the similarities and then look for the differences that were real differences. We found in that case there were a number of um, projects, particularly in, in some communities where they had had a history of, of violence, at both family violence and community violence, and there was a lot of work they had to do even to get to that first stage of engaging the community, that they had to do a lot of um, healing for individuals and, and groups and families and the community before they could engage people. So in the end we said actually these, these communities are different because they they have a different starting place, they have different constraints on the sort of strategies that they can use. And so we, we then talked about those um, slightly differently. Thank you Patricia. Yeah. Um, so going to, to the next um, question, um, this concerns attribution and contribution. Um, and the question is, basically, in order to differentiate between the two, do you have to have a very clear sense of your own activities, its reaching points and outcomes, as well as the interventions other actors are doing um, in the same direction? So is, is that how you would distinguish between attribution and contribution? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I think it, it, it's very easy to attribute everything to you if you're ignorant of what other people are doing. Um, you know, while I've been speaking to you, the sun has come up here in, in Melbourne. Um, I could think it was due to me because I was looking at it. Um, but, um, you know, knowing something about the way the world works, you realise that that's not a very plausible um, explanation. So I think um, it, it, it does mean that you have to, yeah, really understand um, uh, not just what your activities and your outcomes are, but and but how it works. Really getting into the how does this how does change come about? Because sometimes there's work that other organisations have done to create the conditions in which then you can be effective, and that's that doesn't take anything away from the work that you do to be effective, but it says a lot. It, it's very important for you to understand that so that you don't just go into a different situation and think you can run the same program if the, con if the context is different. So I think it, it, that it is true. And you have a second question here about uh, external and internal. Um, yes, I mean the, and, and I think external, I think you know, one of the issues is to think very carefully about different types of accountability that we have um, uh, and, and what people are actually being held accountable for. I think there's a, a big discussion to be had about what we actually mean for about using impact evaluation for accountability because if there's a if we don't do that well there is a there is a risk in that. Um, we clearly want people to be accountable, we want people to make careful use of their money but we also know that some of the things we try which seem like a good idea, where we've done proper risk management, where people have implemented it well and they don't work because we're trying to do really hard things. Um, we don't want people to then be punished because they didn't achieve the impacts if what we've in fact found is that this thing doesn't work. Um, it's being like scientists and saying, you know, we did an experiment, we were hoping to find this, this thing worked. Um, the, the experiment was a success in that we have very good evidence, but the evidence is this thing doesn't work. Um, so I think there's, a, there's, some, there's some thinking about that that we need to do. Um, Patricia, and then I think we just have time for one more question or a couple of more questions. Um, let me put these, try to get these up here for you. Um, so the first is um, from Connie Gonzalez um, asking whether you can talk a little bit more about cost-benefit analysis and its relation to impact evaluation. Um, and then the, the second question is how the unit of analysis affects the design of an impact evaluation. So if you're looking at country level changes sure. and have a small sample size. So if you could just sure. take those two. Sure. Um, I, I, I mean, cost-benefit analysis is built on the premise that the benefits, the observed positive outcomes, have been caused by the program. So unless you have some level of impact evaluation, you know, at some level, you've got to have some, some analysis that says 
that it's plausible, it's, it's credible that, that the outcome, the impacts have been caused by, or produced or contributed to by the intervention, you can't really do cost-benefit analysis. So I think it's actually integral to it and, and when you look hard at some cost-benefit analyses, they're actually quite weak in the causal attribution and so I think that's, a, that's an area that we need to, to do some more work in. Um, and, and that might not mean um, uh, that we have to do impact evaluation of a particular kind, but we, I think we need to do, some, do something around the causal inference. Um, and then this, the, this last question is, is asking about this question of um, small n, a small sample size, um, uh, that, that where um, one, you've got such small numbers that you can't possibly, uh, that random assignment isn't going to give you statistical power. Um, and, and you actually don't even have the possibility of random assignment. And that's where um, uh, some of these other methods are important. Comparative case studies, for example, um, a qualitative comparative method that's about looking at configurations of uh, factors that have, have, have then been associated with particular outcomes. Um, uh, it's come up, it's been developed in political science where they've had exactly this issue. They've been looking at a small number of countries, they haven't been able to randomly assign it and so they've developed systematic and rigorous methods for causal inference that are exactly useful in that area. Um, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation is um, producing a paper that's specifically looking at methods for small n studies um, that, that will talk about the, the, some of these methods uh, in more detail. Well, I'm just conscious of the time. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patricia. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. There's still a lot of questions out there. Um, luckily, um, Patricia has kindly agreed to answer um, additional questions after this webinar. So if you have a question that we didn't get to um, address today, please feel free to send me an email at lgrino at interaction.org by this Thursday and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible and we'll be posting the, the responses on Interaction's website. So if, if you want your question to remain anonymous, please let me know um, when you send your email. We also, of course, welcome your comments on the webinar or the issues discussed, so please feel free to send me those as well. Um, and so I've, some of the questions that were coming in relate to, to the resources or, or sources for some of the methods that Patricia mentioned. So I do want to reiterate that um, the, there are links to many more resources in the guidance note, which, like I said, will be available on Interaction's website after this um, webinar. Um, you'll have the webinar recording itself, um, which you can also access. And then I also wanted to point you to um, the Better Evaluation website, betterevaluation.org, um, which was the source for a lot of the content of this guidance note and which is a resource on evaluation methods and approaches that Patricia is developing also with support from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, I do hope that um, many of you have signed up to, to join us for our next webinar, which will be on March 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, which is a webinar where you'll be able to hear a bit about how two interaction members, Oxfam and Save the Children, are dealing or have dealt with some of the issues that Patricia covers in her note. Um, and the presenters for that will be Allison Davis, Research and Evaluation Advisor at Oxfam America, Mulu Chekel, Senior Director for Monitoring and Evaluation at Save the Children, and Larry Dershem, Senior Design Monitoring and Evaluation Advisor for the Middle East and Eurasia at Save the Children. Um, you have the, the registration link at the bottom of your screen, but if that's too complicated, um, on the website where you'll be able to access the guidance notes, there's also information for how to register for the March 21st event. And that URL is www.interaction.org slash impact dash evaluation dot notes. And that's where you'll be able to find information on all of these guidance notes, future events, etc. So 
thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Great to have so many of you on the webinar and hope to see you all on the 21st as well. Thank you. Thanks. Good. Goodbye. Bye.